Hello everyone and welcome to the Geek Night podcast. I am your host Kaivalya Apte and I am back with another interesting episode. Today it's going to be a very fun conversation because I have uh, Andrea with me. Uh and I I found out about Andrea from his post. He he uh, regularly posts on LinkedIn on different topics related to software engineering and uh, his posts are very insightful you know backed by some his experience and also some resources that are really insightful uh, so i thought let's invite him and talk about software engineering practices in general because i think there are there's so much information yet there's there are so many myths there are misconceptions and uh, there's lack of clarity So uh here here we are uh thanks Andrea for joining the episode I'm really excited to have you here and uh let's start with a brief introduction Yeah so good morning and thank thank you KB for having me on it's it's a real pleasure Um so yeah I'm I'm Andrea Forja I've been a software engineer for 23 years now uh, I started in 1999 as a C developer uh got my first job um in the field of computer telephony integration so i spent a few years of my career uh at the start of my career as a, as a c and c++ developer working on interactive voice response systems as well as automatic call distribution systems then i had a chance to work on large enterprise systems written with java mm-hmm. uh which at the time was quite a popular language uh still popular language but at the time was really strong yeah. um and and all the java ecosystem which which also was um big world um and uh and so java has been my my language of choice for a very long time now um occasionally i worked with um python javascript c sharp delphi c++ um and i've worked in many different um industry sectors both, both as a front end engineer back end engineer full stack engineer i work in financial services so banking insurance stock broking wealth management uh, risk and compliance um as well as um accounting optimization uh betting publishing uh military system systems for government so i'm sure i'm forgetting something um and recently i joined zopa uh which is a bank based in london uh i work in the developer experience team which is a great experience um uh we we try to make life easier for our fellow developers by um you know helping them providing the right tools automating process and and so on it's, a, it's been a great experience so far Awesome awesome so as as we can all see you know there's a lot of you know deep experience in multiple areas uh wearing multiple hats uh so i am really excited to talk about you know the software engineering practices uh that are widely known and uh let let's start so before we dive deep into these practices uh i wanted to ask you you know as a developer uh if i if i'm good at coding if i know what i'm doing why do i care about software engineering practices at all how does it help me well it, it, the, the idea is continuous improvement right and clearly when we discuss practices mm-hmm. um practices are very tied to a specific context right mm-hmm. so you work in a in a company that is different from my company you develop different products i develop yeah. different products and and so clearly our practices will have differences but in general when we look at software engineering um some some areas are very close to each other so some some types of products are very close to each other so when we discuss practices clearly we don't want to tell anyone you should be doing this but yeah. the idea is that um when we analyze the industry when we look at the industry and there are studies like the one contained in the accelerate book we can see that there are common elements that make companies uh, high performing right mm-hmm. and so the idea is that we want to encourage uh people to embrace those practices so the reason why you need to care is, is is do you want to be better do you want to help your company achieve better results and and the idea is that look at these practices this is this is what has worked in 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 fields that are very close to yours you might want to look into that whenever we discuss best practices in our industry we need to consider the word best as a kind of a linguistic shortcut we don't really mean this is the best you know yeah. that that you, you it's it's really the idea is really this is this is what has worked really well in mm-hmm. in in so many fields and has produced so many results so many good results that you might want to look into that so it's a way of encouraging people to 
to look into these these practices. Yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. And so this was mainly from the individual perspective, right? Like, so as a software engineer, it's it's best for me to also be aware of what kind of practices do we use, what has worked for others, and to grow in one's career. You know, uh, yeah. you may not just be a you know coder. You can also become a manager. Or you can become a director, yeah. and you know you can be be a tech lead or in, a senior engineer. And I think <laughs> for all those roles, understanding these practices at least helps to you know shape up the career in a in a better manner. Uh, so I I agree. I totally agree with that. Uh, from the team's perspective and from the organization's perspective, uh, how how does these practices help uh, if followed, or is there a way to you know tweak what works for a particular team, what works for a, a particular organization? Is is that the way to go, or how how do you approach that? Well, I, I think Lily, you always need to take into account your particular context, what you want mm-hmm. to achieve, your products, right, yeah. and your processes, yeah. and, and 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 obviously that's that's the, the how you satisfy your customers is the first main priority for you, right? Absolutely. As well, not not for you, but I mean for a company yeah. in general, right? I'm sure for you as well as, as an employee <laughs> of your company. Uh, so the the thing is to. We, we, software engineering is a practice that has been going on for, for many, many years now. And we have um, experimented with many different ways of building software. You know, um, uh, there has been a, uh, there have been a, like interactive and incremental approaches at the start of our, uh, you know, uh, at the start of software engineering in, in history, like 1950s, 1960s. And then we've gone through waterfall and then we've gone back to adaptive uh, models. And it, it, I think we've discovered that the best way of writing software is using adaptive processes. Mm-hmm. So in general, no matter what your context is, if you are developing software, you might want to adopt these adaptive methods because yeah. they've proven to be the best way of, of, of writing um, software. So anything that derives from the adoption of those uh, models is yeah. worth looking looking at. Yeah. 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 I think, I think I agree with that. So, uh, Let's dive deep into, you know, some of the most common practices in software development. So let's start with uh, agile software development, right? Uh, That's a pretty famous one, yet uh, maybe most confused ones, or (laughs) there's there's so much clarity, but still lack of clarity. So let's start with, you know, in your view, uh, what is agile software development? So agile is the name that was given to this new... I would say new formulation of old ideas. As I was mentioning before, uh, when we started dealing with software, uh, mm. we we discovered that the best way of writing software was to use adaptive methods, yeah. so in, 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 iterative and incremental uh, methods. And Agile um, came about in two thousand one, and and it was kind of re- the, the result of a discussion between experts uh, about these. Um, so-called lightweight frameworks, um, which which had existed for about ten years at the time. Like I think the first um, application of Scrum was in 1991, for example. And there were many different lightweight frameworks at the time. There yeah. was uh, a unified process, replica- rapid application development, Scrum, XP, DSDM, FDD. They were crystal clear. There were many of them, and yeah. so. The Agile was the result of a discussion about these methods and how to um, indicate a software development model that will be effective and 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 good and good in, in general for, for for companies to adopt, and and so they they formalized this new way of, of looking at software in a, uh, in a manifesto which was uh, called the Manifesto for Agile Software Development, which contains yeah. four values, twelve principles. Very simple, very straightforward, and they put a spin on the interactive aspect of software development by um, talking about this continuous practice, so continuous delivery of valuable software, mm. continuous communication within the team, continuous invo- continuous involvement of the customer, continuous feedback, yeah. and also on the incremental aspect, which was deliver valuable software. So make sure that at the end of each iteration, you have produced an increment of, of your product. So you have added value to your yeah. product. Um, and so, yeah, that, that was the the way they, they they called it, Agile, because that the idea was to be able to respond to change quickly, 
mm-hmm. right? And yeah. be able to, be able to gear up in a way that you can uh, accommodate late requirements that you don't, you're not tied like in the old way, like, you know, uh, uh, it happened with, with Waterfall, which had been dominating the industry for 20 years at the time, where you had to do a big upfront design, had to come up with technical uh, user requirements and, and and everything was kind of cast in stone. Even though that wasn't really the, the original intention of Waterfall. Waterfall yeah. was uh, Waterfall has applied by the industry it was a big misunderstanding. It was Dr. Winston Royce who wrote the paper about Waterfall said, "Don't do it this way." It was it was really saying this model invites failures, and then and then the industry actually did exactly the opposite. Um, and so yeah, that, that Agile is a v- very simple model which unfortunately has been <laughs> misunderstood yeah. big time by the industry. And, and I was listening to a, to a podcast by Uncle Bob describing the, the origin of Agile because he's, he's written a book uh, called Clean, Clean Agile where he yeah. tries to get people back to the origins. Uh, and he was saying that basically Agile was misunderstood as soon as it came out. Yeah, yeah. I think I, I have somewhat similar experience. And, you know, when you say to people, you know, do not try this at home, <clears throat> they, they are you know, more inclined to trying it out. So I think that's what happened with Waterfall as well. Uh, Great. Uh, Let's let's, uh, dive deep into some of the misunderstandings or where did Agile go wrong as as an industry? So I think think the main problem in the industry is that it's capital A Agile, right? What is normally called capital A Agile, which Mm -hmm. is Agile seen as a product, Mm -hmm. as an off-the-shelf product, which you can buy and use as is, right? And I quite like the phrase used by Dave Thomas, one of the creators of the Agile Manifesto. He said, Agile is not what you do, because agility is how you do it. Because mm. Agile doesn't really tell you what to do, right? Yeah. It just shows you what agility looks like once you embrace those values, those principles. And this is the biggest the biggest problem that I see in the industry, the fact that when you hire an agile coach, because you want your company to be more agile, yeah. um, they start teaching your team how to use Scrum. Mm-hmm. And they focus on the mechanics of a framework. They start telling them, oh, you need to have a daily stand up, you need to do sprint retrospective, sprint, sprint planning, uh, sprint review, etc. Uh, and it, sometimes they add even corollary practices, like you have to estimate, you have to calculate velocity, you have to do environment charts, right? And and all of that can be very confusing to a team that has never done Agile before, to a company that, has, that doesn't know what Agile is, yeah. uh, because it looks very prescriptive and it's not mm. really looking at how to improve the processes and the culture of that company so that they can be more Agile in the long term. Because I, I really don't like the, the expression um, Agile transformation, because it mm-hmm. gives me the idea that you're going from non-Agile to Agile by switching something on, right? It's not like you're not Agile today and, yeah. hey, presto, tomorrow you're Agile. Exactly. Right? It, agility is something that you achieve step by step, and yeah. and it really requires the whole company to participate in that process. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's one mistake. I know that historically there are some fields of the industry that don't particularly like incremental and iterative approaches, and so they don't like Agile either because uh, they think that it doesn't really fit their model very well. Like, for example, mm-hmm. avionics or, or the medical field where you have highly regulated um, yeah. uh, work that needs to go through very deep uh, testing phases. But I know I've worked in some highly regulated fields where there was this bias that they couldn't use Agile. And in reality, they could. If you looked at how they were doing stuff, I think uh, I, I, I'm, I'm sure they could because I because I was actually doing Agile, even though the managers uh, thought we yeah. weren't doing Agile. <laughs> it was working. Nice. Uh, so I think I think this this is the probably the biggest problem with Agile. And, yeah. and, and Dave Thomas, one again, one of the creators of the manifesto, wrote a, uh, did did a, gave a very good good talk called Agile is Dead, which was kind of shocking, right? The title was kind of shocking, but he goes through this and he explains how Agile has generated things like safe or less, you know, scaled agile, which really don't don't work very well. Mm, yeah, interesting. So if I have to summarize, uh, you know, uh, what you have described right now. So I think what I see is two points. One is like agile is not like a product you could use. It's mm-hmm. a it's a process. It's a it's a direction you have to move towards. And 
it's not like a destination it's a it's a journey that you have to continuously Absolutely. evolve and you know uh, make progress on that so as you said there is no flag where you say you are not agile or you are agile uh, and you have to continuously uh, keep working on that so let's say i i create like a startup and uh, i have a bunch i hire a bunch of engineers and i want to make my software development agile right what are the building blocks uh, that you would recommend well I, i i think i think it's important to focus on the values and principle of agile i think it's important to agree at the start that mm. that's the way we want to work i doubt any company wouldn't work wouldn't want to to adopt those principles because yeah. they are very sensible principles right what yeah. companies doesn't want to satisfy their customer through delivery of valuable software right that yeah. that's what you want to do so i i don't think so the, as i was saying before one of the mistakes is that you start adopting a framework that other companies adopt so okay. typically it's scrum because scrum is the most common uh, one and i would probably i would not i would refrain from adopting a specific framework so i would look at what we want to do and try look at the manifesto look at the, those values agree that those values are those that we we agree with that we want to adopt and and and, and implement whatever process what however our, our our teams want to work because one one of the main aspect of agile is that your team must be self organizing mm. so go and experiment different ways of working go uh, mm. as long as you agree on the fact that you have to deliver frequently to your customer yeah. and and have valuable software and 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 do something that you know really values for your customer it's it's really important it's a high priority uh, yeah. items that you deliver whatever process you whatever way of working you want to adopt is is fine i wouldn't be too prescriptive and mm. um, i always tell the story when i when i started uh, the early years of my career the early years of my career i mm-hmm. i didn't know what agile was i I, I literally didn't know what what it was. Uh, yeah. Also, because it didn't exist yet, probably. <laughs> That's probably why. Uh, but yeah. I was, but I didn't know what the agile methods that mm. you know uh, led to agile were. And and the way I was working on on a on a project on a new project for 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 a client was agile because I was talking to the customer, sitting in the same space as the customer, mm. communicating with them daily. Yeah. The writing, you know, building small increments, delivering those increments, getting feedback. And so it was basically agile. And I think if you are a startup that wants to achieve results quickly, mm. then just fo- focus on that. Focus on what you want to achieve. Don't focus on frameworks, right? Yeah. And um just just focus on that and 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 let that method, way of working evolve. Um and you know I, I, that that's how I, i know it doesn't really help because i'm not really giving you any any tips or, or indications but it's really it's really because i think it should be open to exploration it should be open to experimentation and finding what the right way of working is for for your team and your company yeah i think that's a very valuable suggestion and that's in a way it's a help right like don't follow any f- random frameworks yes. just because there are frameworks Absolutely. but follow what works for you but i think uh, what you mentioned again uh, is to connect yourself and your process to your customers right because yes. ultimately you're working for someone you want to deliver features fast and iteratively and i think delivering features fast and iteratively are kind of connected you can't do one and not the other right uh, so no. if, yeah so and i think it's also important to also react quickly if something is not working uh, so give that feedback and fuel it in uh, back to your system to keep improving so i think that's what agility is and then whatever framework exactly. you follow it's it's up to you right okay that makes sense uh let's let's talk about the uh, you know the available frameworks that the so called popular frameworks for example scrum so yeah. how would how does uh, scrum help uh, in in your opinion and what are the alternatives to scrum Does Scrum help? <laughs> no, just kidding. Um, uh, Scrum is one of the as well is one of the many. As I was saying before, is one of the many frameworks that was available yeah. um, at the time Agile came about. And of course, because it's one of those that led to Agile, right? The creators of 
Scrum are also co-creators of the Agile Manifesto. Um, Scrum is the most popular one. There are other um, frameworks like Kanban, which is also very popular. Uh, and I would say XP as well, um, yeah. which is probably more focused on on, on technical practices than, than... I mean, it has its rule about how to organize work, but it's highly focused on, on technical practices. Um, Scrum is... Um, a, a framework. I don't like to call it an agile framework because I don't think it's inherently agile. You can use Scrum in an agile way. You can use it in a non-agile way. I've seen teams that were adopting Scrum and ticking all the boxes in the Scrum guide, but not necessarily ticking all the boxes in the agile manifesto. Uh, yeah. Um, okay. The Scrum guide says, so, so Scrum is, is, is described by the Scrum guide. And the Scrum guide you know, talks about the roles, the product owner role, the, 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 the Scrum master developer and team, and the, all the events that need to happen, right? The daily stand-ups, the sprint planning, and, and the retrospective review. Um, whilst the manifesto talks about different things, the manifesto talks about values and principles. So mm. you need to kind of glue the three things together in order to adopt Scrum in an agile way. And, and I think this goes back to what we were discussing before, the fact that adopting Scrum doesn't necessarily make you agile. Right. Mm. Um, I think Scrum has not aged very well. Um, it's quite prescriptive uh, in terms of roles and, and events that need to happen. It's um, it's something that has attracted a lot of, um, I was saying hatred, I, I, I'd say criticism to be yeah. more polite. <laughs> um, and I think, I think some level of technical criticism I agree with, like, for example, um, the duration of the iterations, right? It says it should be, you should go from two weeks to four weeks. Four weeks is quite a long time. It's, yeah. it's, I think it's the initial duration of, of, of Scrum Sprints when, when Scrum came about. Um, and, and the team, and you know, I, I understand what people today say. Today we have technologies, we have the cloud, we have a way of spinning up environments very quickly to validate our, the, the, the delivery of our software very quickly. So we can deliver any time, at any time during the day. Uh, so why should we wait to? So, so I agree with that. Um, and yeah. uh, why do we need to always have a daily stand-up if we are working together? Like if you adopt social programming practices, why do we need to have a stand-up? And then I agree with that as well. Um, plannings can be very painful with, with Scrum because you need to have an idea of how much work, how much work you, it fits in the iteration. And, and there is no way to do planning yeah. in, in, a, in a non-painful way. Um, it, it, there is this concept of a product yeah. backlog which can be waste because, you know, you tend to look too too long, too far into the future. Um, some other criticisms I don't agree with, like when people say Scrum doesn't work because calculating velocity doesn't work, for example, and that's not something that Scrum, the Scrum guide prescribes. It, 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 it's how you estimate, how you if, if you want to calculate velocity is up to you. Um, but I, I guess my biggest pet peeve with Scrum yeah. is that I, and, and this is something that is, is a very common perception, is that Scrum has become a big uh, commercial yeah. operation. So you have uh, this certified Scrum Master mm. uh, certification meal, and people tend to get those certifications because yeah. they want to access jobs, not because they want to help companies to be more agile. And also um, this idea that yeah. the creators of, the, um, of Scrum keep telling people, you know, that, that Scrum is easy to understand but difficult to master. And I get the sense, again, this is me being, this is my very personal opinion. I get this impression that the industry wants to keep Scrum difficult to master because they then sell you services to, to, to teach you how to, how to master it. Um, yeah, so that, that Scrum, unfortunately, yeah. I, I don't like it very much. I, 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 I mean, if a company and if a team is using Scrum and they are being effective, they are, they are being agile, absolutely keep doing it. I'm, I'm not going to knock their door and say, hey, change, change the way we're working. Right, keep doing it. Uh, you can yeah. use Scrum in an agile way, absolutely. Um, so, but if I had to choose, it, I probably wouldn't wouldn't go there. Would wouldn't choose Scrum. Nice. So, w would you would you prefer Kanban then? I prefer anything that okay. works. My <laughs> <laughs> context. So, I think I've got to the point where um, <laughs> I'm not giving you a very good answers today. <laughs> uh, I, I think I've got to the point where I can I tend to abstract from 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 the from the specifics of a framework, I heard uh, Alan Holub, uh, who's a great, 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 great guy, great personality. I really like mm -hmm. his style. Uh, he said, 
um, he really doesn't like Scrum. He says Scrum probably work in the context where Jeff Sutherland and Kent Raber were, were working, but it doesn't necessarily work everywhere else. And I think it's kind of right there. I, I think it, that is the problem with trying to build a framework out of the practices that work in your context, mm. right? Uh, if I had to adopt um, a, a framework, I would probably go with Kanban. I quite like the idea of having a one-piece flow, uh, fast-flowing um, uh, process where I have a working work in progress limitation yeah. where I tend to remove waste. And, and I really like the pull-based aspect of, of Kanban, the fact that, that we can pull work as, as needed versus the scrum push based mechanism, which I, in my experience doesn't work very, very well. I mean, I've, I've seen a lot of scrum teams. I can safely say that it, this doesn't work very well. Maybe other people can teach me how to do it. I'm not saying that, you know, my, my view is the yeah. view. Um, but the, 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 the only thing is that whichever framework you want to adopt, if you don't want to adopt mm. scrum, be careful how, why you want to move to the okay. framework. Because I've seen teams who were moving away from Scrum, and and typically the natural um, framework they land to is Kanban. So there is a lot of teams that move from Scrum to Kanban. But uh, analyze the reasons why you want to do that. Because if you want to leave Scrum because it's Scrum, that's one thing. But if you want to leave Scrum, the the right motivation should be I want to leave Scrum because I want to be more mm-hmm. agile. Because I've seen a lot of teams that move from Scrum to Kanban but they don't necessarily work in a more agile yeah. way. Like there are teams who work with Kanban, they work on the next item, they they, they finish it and they never deliver. Mm-hmm. And, and and you need to keep in mind that the fact that you need to work in an adap- adaptive way. So you need to deliver something, get feedback, see if it works, see validate with your customer, right? So again, Kanban is, is a framework. So if you, you, it's not inherently agile you have to you you have to bear in mind the values yeah. and the principles of yeah. agile. it uh, at, at the start it felt like i am that journalist who is trying to get some controversial answers from you <laughs> 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 but yeah i think it makes sense that you know there's no one thing fits all uh it's you have to try it out you have to try what, what works for you and uh, if something worked for in, in some other context that may not work for your context. So understanding the context Absolutely. first, I think that is the first step. Uh, I think I agree with that. And I've, in my experience, at least, uh, I've seen that, you know, we have followed Scrum, uh, like a different flavor. Uh, like even we tried with, you know, one week sprint, which was too short and creating a lot of overhead for us. Then we tried yeah. like two weeks, which was maybe somewhere at the sweet spot, giving us a good balance as a team. And we were able to, you know, push features in an agile manner. So that worked quite well. And then the in the other team, we were following Kanban. It was also working quite yeah. nicely. So mm-hmm. I think it boils down to, as you rightly said, you know, uh, you're building for your customers and you want to build features fast. You want to go to the market as quickly as possible because there's so much competition and you want to solve the problem in a better way, quickly, and for the customer. So I think that makes yeah. sense. Uh, Moving on, I think you mentioned a couple of points there. You know, one was about estimations and then the other one was about yeah. velocity, right? So if I'm, as a as a manager, let's say I'm an engineering manager, I want to plan some work, uh, uh, let's say for the next quarter. And I have some, you know, a roadmap. Let's, let's call it a roadmap that I want to uh, deliver feature A, B, and C. And then these are like bigger chunks of work and then uh, distributed, let's say, across <clears throat> three or f- four teams. And then they have to, you know, split those bigger chunks into smaller ones and, you know, come up with some rough estimations that, oh, it will take us, let's say, one month to complete all of these features. Yeah. Or let's say one week for this feature, two weeks for this feature and so on. So talking about estimations, right? I've never seen estimations going absolutely correct. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what are your thoughts? Should, should we, if, if estimations are, you know, always going to be wrong, should we even care about them? Has, has estimation worked for you in your experience ever? Do you really want to do that? <laughs> <laughs> um, so estimation is, is always a very controversial topic. Yeah. Um, it always creates friction, tension between, between within, within organization. Yeah. I think one of the problems is that estimation means different things to different mm. people. Like if you talk to engineers, estimation is um, it's some way of understanding 
how, how long it's going to take me to, to finish this work in my in, in a short term, right? In like yeah. next iteration, how much work fits the next iteration, right? And whilst for managers, estimation is more like forecasting, you know, right? How, how long it's going to take to finish this 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 work? What, what do I tell a customer? How do I organize my work? And I have to say, um, most of the times I see miscommunication between engineers and managers on estimation where nobody wants to listen to, to the reasons. Uh, the, the problem with estimation in software engineering that I've seen is you have these three actors, yeah. right? You have humans, of course. You have software and you have yeah. business. And, all, and these three actors have very different natures and they are all prima donnas and they have to work well together and it's really difficult to make them work well together and i think one of the purposes of these adaptive methods is just to find a way of, of, of you know making them you know kind of oiling the mechanism make, make them work okay. together and um i think what one big problem with estimation in uh, as as normally used in software engineering is the fact that it assumes that you are able to look into the future and 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 stick to a, to a long term plan, right? Even releasing quarterly for yeah. me is a long term plan because the spirit of agile is really let's do something small, let's deliver it, let's let's collect feedback and let's and let's um, decide yeah. what to do next, right? Let's let's do the next item. Now I understand for many companies working that way. It's difficult because they start. They are historically more used to a waterfall-based yeah. model, um, but forcing estimates on on developers, so demanding estimates, can have very bad effects yeah. because it's not like engineers don't want to yeah. estimate. It's it's not it's not unwillingness. It's impossibility at times. I've been in many situations where my team was asked to estimate a very big backlog of, of items, many of which were were unknown even to the product mm -hmm. owner. Even the product owner didn't know what they would actually entail. He had just created a rough roadmap in his head, but he didn't really know the details of that work. So when we estimated those those items, we came up with very large numbers, right? If you do a like a t-shirt size yeah. exercise, those would all end up in the XXXXL <laughs> <laughs> bucket, right? And then there was this very clownish game of associating a number of weeks to each bucket. And then, of course, because many of them would end up in the more uncertain buckets, the number would explode and it would be a big number. And the, customer, and the manager wasn't happy with that. Oh, you need to get better at estimating, yeah. right? That, that's, that's always the, the mantra that hope, often happens. And, and, and there is this very... Uh, a tricky game of try. How do we get better at estimating? Mm -hmm. And there are defensive mechanisms that engineers use to protect themselves from the weaponization of their numbers for, by, by 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 managers. Um, and and so they come up with big estimates where there is a lot of buffer, a lot of contingency. It's really it's really um, bad because often managers decide not to go in one direction mm -hmm. and implement a product because of these big numbers, because of these, yeah. you know, two, it's going to take too long. It's going to cost too much. And in reality, if there was a step-by-step -step approach where they, we went in increments and we exposed um, what well, our financial exposure would be limited. And then we would, you know, bid whether we want to continue or not, that may be that product would, 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 would arise and would, would uh, bring revenues, would bring value yeah. to the company. Um, so yeah, I, I subscribe to the no estimates uh, uh, movement. Shall I call <laughs> it that way? Um, where 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 you you basically try? We, you're not you're not saying we we're not going to forecast, right? We want to listen to managers and we want to say, okay, let's let's forecast, but let's forecast based on actual data, on historical data, on the on. Let's look at the cycle time. Let's look at how how many. Uh, items we have delivered in a unit of time. Let's project based on actual work. Let's have a statistical analysis on 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 our you know existing yeah. work based on our existing yeah. work and project something that's much more reliable. I've seen in my career how often because managers use this argument all the time. They say, "Oh, customer needs estimates. They they don't write blank checks. You don't understand business if you think you're not going to give me a number." 
But the reality is what I have seen in my career is that often it's not customers who need estimates. It's managers yeah. because they are used to working that way. If you come to me and you say, look, Andrea, I have this very, I have this, this idea of a product for my company, which was, would be really valuable. And all these are the items that I need. And I said, okay, KB, I can do this for you. We're going to deliver this at some, at some point in the future. Then of course you're going to tell me well, but tell me how much it's going to cost, how much, how much, how long yeah. it takes, because I, I might decide to spend my money, my money yeah, differently, yeah. right? And 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 that that's a problem, right? It's it's um it's yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> just thinking out loud yeah, yeah, right yeah. now. No, I think it, I think it makes <laughs> sense. thinking of all the sad moments. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it makes sense, and uh, you know the push is somewhat coming from the competition, you know, the salespeople, they, they try yes. to, you know, uh, provide some estimations to the customers and then they communicate these estimations to the engineering team or the product team. And then they, it boils down to, you know, coming to the developers. And since there is this fear of, you know, what, what if I say three days and then it takes one week, what, what is that? So we add some buffer and, eventually say uh, for every feature we say okay it is going to take one week or excel or whatever size unit we use uh, so yes I, i've also seen estimates used in a very different way and they were not very productive i think rough estimations is still fine if it works uh, based on some data or some previous data that that you mentioned and what I find uh, very challenging oftentimes is, you know, it also depends on the nature of the work, right? For example, if if I'm yeah. working on a feature, which let's say is is very simple feature, I know what to do. It's just about writing code, testing it out and, you know, building it. So that might be quick, right? On the other hand, there is some investigation work. We are, we don't know if it's, if at all it's yeah. going to work. Even in, investigation might just take, mm -hmm. you know, three days. Uh, so I think yeah. what I found useful is having this time boxed uh, investigation process and seeing if things are working, just having a POC ready. And then based on that, creating like a realistic sort of estimation. Again, I'm going back to estimation, but there's some uh, data behind that. Like there are there is possibility to implement this feature based on this investigation and looks like it is going to take some uh, some time. It I agree. It's a very valid uh, point, and I, and I think I quite like the the phrase that um, Uncle Bob used when he described Robert yeah. Martin, uh, who went when he described uh, Agile. He said the purpose of an Agile iteration is not to create code, yeah. but to create data, mm -hmm. and data really what drives your your decision. Yeah. Um, and he he also said the, the one purpose of Agile is to destroy hope uh, and 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 replace it with yeah. data. Um, I think what, one problem with long term estimation is the fact that it doesn't take into account the fact that a team at some point might want to stop and think. Like we've, we've, we've spent the first three iterations working on something. Now we need to do something else. Is our architecture still valid for that? Is our design still yeah. valid for that? Can, shall we change something? Shall we do some work to, to you know, you want to keep your design evolutionary, yeah. right? But in order to be able to accommodate change. Yeah. And that kind of activity, that kind of introspection and adaptation it's really hard to foresee, right? You can't, you can't foresee it when you, when you, when you think of a long-term plan. Well, how do I know? How do I cater for all those occasions where I will need to revise what I've already done, yeah. right? Um, uh, so yeah, it's it's um, every time someone tries to uh, use a crystal ball of some type <laughs> and look into the future, it doesn't work very yeah. well with software. Agreed, agreed. Uh, I think I've already got a gist of you know what you think about uh, estimations and also velocity, but I still want to ask you, <laughs> what do you think about velocity, yeah, yeah. tracking velocity? <clears throat> like, how, has it ever worked or it's it's never going to work? No, I think I think velocity is, is, is something that even Ron Jeffries, who came, came with, came up with with a concept of velocity originally, he profusely apologized mm. for that. And he, and he also apologized for story points. <laughs> Um, he explained what, how story points came about and, and it was really a way of uh, obfuscate time yeah. and create a language that managers wouldn't understand yeah. and they, they ended up understanding it and so it didn't work. Uh, um, <clears throat> I, think, I think velocity has the same problem as every metric, which is if you set a target on a metric, yeah. 
on a measure. There's a, there's a law called good outs law that says that if you, when you set a target, when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. And that's because you have this uh, phenomenon called surrogation. So your metric becomes the value that you look at. If you have a number, that number can go up or down, and up is positive and down is negative, then of course you're going to focus your your work on making the number go up rather than improving the value that the number represents and the indicates, yeah. right? So velocity per se is not is not a bad metric. It's, it's a metric, yeah. right? Something it measures something, but is when you say, oh, we've done twenty points, we need to do thirty, mm-hmm. right? That things get because because what happens there is all sorts of psychological mechanism kick in in order to achieve the number, but not necessarily improve. The, the how much we deliver. Um, this is a problem that applies to velocity, but applies to other metrics as well. It applies to test test coverage, for example. There is this idea yeah. in teams that they have to achieve high test coverage. And I've seen teams where people were starting testing getters and setters to achieve that, that level of, you know, uh, you know all sorts <laughs> of crazy mechanisms. Because if your bonus and if your rewards depend on yeah. that, you're going to do that, yeah. right? People say good as law is not a law because it doesn't always trigger this mechanism. Yeah. And I think that they're wrong. Most of the time, this argument comes from people who work in the field of metrics. So they sell products <laughs> that are related to metrics. Yeah. Um, uh, but I think it is a law because we're humans. And every time someone sets a target on something, we, we're going to instinctively work towards mm. that target. Even in good faith, I've seen teams where people were, in order to achieve a higher velocity, they were pumping up their estimates. The three would become a five, yeah. the five would become an eight. And all of a sudden, you have a high velocity, but you don't necessarily, you're delivering the same amount of work. Um, uh, the, the other, as I was saying before, there's, there's a disturbing number of products that are coming up in the industry, mm-hmm. which focus on metrics, who focus on velocity, as well as other crazy stuff like number of commits, yeah. number of close PRs, right? And they start measuring teams based on mm-hmm. that. And it's completely wrong. Yeah. It's, it's exactly what you're not supposed to do. Uh, so yeah, my my view of velocity is is, is negative. It's a vanity metric. It's something that makes you look good, but it doesn't really say anything about your your how you perform. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. So try try to avoid it. I I agree. Uh, so in my experience, what I've seen once is you know we were tracking this velocity and we were having some target velocity that we wanted to achieve, and it it yeah. kind of impacted the quality of work we were doing because we were focusing more on closing the issues or closing the tickets that we had instead of focusing on you know the real quality what we are what what value are we adding for the customer right and then we eventually exactly. said okay this is just an overhead we are we are not getting anything tracking the velocity so let's just you know avoid that and then the overall you know the the health of the team also improved that they were they were not under this uh, constant pressure of achieving something like some some uh, weird number that is just a number and nothing more right yeah so i think that yeah, helped and absolutely. I, I i totally agree with that uh great points there so with this let's move to a slightly more technical parts of the software engineering practices yeah. so uh i think another mm-hmm. very famous uh you know practice is ci cd and uh yeah. so what are your mm-hmm. opinion let's let's uh, describe what is ci cd first and then uh I have some questions, let's say, uh, for an organization. Uh, when do you think yeah. an organization is mature enough to follow something like CICD? Or is there something like that? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so CICD is often um, mentioned at CI slash CD. And I really don't like that because I, I think it's become a name yeah. that sometimes means it has nothing to do with either CI or CD. I've heard very crazy arguments from people say, oh, I don't think continuous integration is the only way you can achieve CI, CD. Ignoring that CI <laughs> is continuous integration, right? Uh, so so the, the, the thing is, CI slash CD is, is a very popular name on CVs, on job yeah. specs, and, and then the way pe- people describe how, what they're yeah. doing. But it's mostly something that is used for a, some sort of process that fetches code from a VCS, builds it, creates some artifacts, maybe maybe registers those artifacts and delivers them to deploys them to some sandbox environment, right? And maybe it does it for for a branch. For example, you have PRs that get built that way. Um, 
And that's not really what CI or CD mean. They are more general practices. CI is the is continuous integration, is the idea of merging work from multiple developers into the same branch. So say, and, and it's it's the main line of development. So it's trunk or master or yeah. main, whatever we call it today. And multiple times a day, uh, hopefully multiple times a day. Uh, continuous delivery is an extension of CI, is, is an idea that builds on top of CI. Mm -hmm. And it's the the idea that you are set up to deliver at any point in time, that your, your the software is always in a releasable state and you can deliver frequently, you can fix, you can deliver features frequently, but you can also fix bugs uh, frequently. Yeah. Um, I think these practices are really important today because software has become um, what no normal a Norman would 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 say an invisible technology today. Like software today is everywhere. It's it's, it's we we carry three or four computers on us all the time, right? <laughs> the smartphone, the, the headset, the yeah. watch, uh, and and it's really important. This is my opinion. It's really important for companies that that produce software to be able to fix problems as soon as they arise and to deliver, to, in order to be competitive with with each yeah. other, to be able to deliver as quickly as possible. Um, and continuous delivery is is exactly that, is is, is basically building your, uh, embracing this this practice of having a high performing, highly efficient way of, of producing high quality products fast. So better software faster, mm -hmm. as, as Dave Farley describes it. And it's for me the best way to to do CD is what uh, they Farley and Jay Zumble describe in their book Continuous Delivery. It's called Continuous Delivery, and um, and so yeah. So the the uh, you you were asking uh, when a company is mature to do that. Um, I I don't really like the word mature when we talk about practices mm -hmm. because mature to me indicates a some point where you get to and then at that point you say oh i'm good enough now to yeah. do this and, and and it's really it's really a, a process right um it's it's pretty much like agile i think agile and continuous delivery are tightly coupled because the first principle of agile says our highest priority is to uh, satisfy our customers through early and continuous delivery of valuable yeah. software and they finally explicitly said our concept of continuous delivery is what Agile means by continuous yeah. delivery. So the same principle of Agile applies, mm -hmm. right? Uh, when are you mature to do continuous delivery? Anytime. Anytime you build, you you are able to build a, a pipeline that delivers your, your software uh, fast, efficiently, uh, as a high quality product, you, you, you're mature to do, to do yeah. CD. Um, it's really up to you. All right. Right. Uh, and of course there is a, there is, there is some investment time and energy yeah. into this. It's not, uh, but you know, software has the advantage of being uh, much cheaper than other artifacts to to create. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, yeah, I think I agree, and uh, I'm kind of aligned with the definition that you mentioned for CI/CD as well. Uh, I I want to take like a practical example just to understand uh, how CI/CD would work in that case. So uh, most of the times there are like multiple teams, you know, uh, having systems that interact yeah. with each other, and let's say different teams have different priorities, different backlogs as they call it. And let's say my team is working on a feature that is blocked by another team. So how, how does that work? Like CI CD work in that sense. So I can, I am ready with my changes or my feature development. I am ready to go as soon as you know, I can to the broad environment, yeah. but I am blocked on another team. So, what mm -hmm. I've seen typically uh, it's done is, you know, we have some something called a feature flag where we just have like a config yeah. which says, okay, the code can be deployed, but it, it cannot be enabled that the flow yeah. would be disabled yeah. and only enabled when the other team is ready. So how does that yeah. kind of a relation works uh, in, in when we talk about CICD? Yeah, so CI, CI continuous integration is... Um, the best way of doing it today, in my opinion, is exactly what you just described. So if you, <clears throat> for me, the best way of doing CI is adopting trunk-based development. Mm -hmm. So you are committing straight, either straight to trunk, uh, which is preferable, or um, you are using short-lived branches, uh, which last maximum one yeah. day. Uh, and, 
and and the idea is that because it's it's a fast flow of 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 uh, in, basically incomplete work that goes into into mass. Of course, you want to hide it in some mm -hmm. way if the feature is unfinished. There are cases where you don't even need a feature toggle because that specific part of the code is not activated by any external behavior. Yeah. So, for example, if you add an, an API endpoint to 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 a to a system and that API is never published, isn't accessible yeah. to users. You you don't need to, to put any 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 feature toggle, um, but but yeah, that, that's what I would suggest. I, I think the idea is to distinguish the two phase the the the, the um, deployment of code from releasing of features. Yeah. Right, we are traditionally used to conflating the two things together because you know we don't have a way of distinguishing when we are when we are delivering our code to to production that we are releasing necessarily releasing the feature represented mm -hmm. by that code but the, the idea here is really to to distinguish the two things and that code is one thing it can be continuously integrated yeah. features are the different things if they depend on each other that's fine you will release them when they are uh, available i think i think the model you described is is a very valid one okay okay yeah sounds good uh <clears throat> about so i i did not know about tdd like a few years ago i read about tdd yeah. i started implementing it um uh, i also did a podcast on tdd uh, just to show like how it is done i mean it's not the mm. ideal way of doing it but like one way of approaching tdd and you know uh, but yeah i'm i'm sure uncle bob's uh, resources on tdd are the best one <laughs> out there uh, what are your thoughts on tdd and uh, what do you think TDD is most suitable for? Are there cases when TDD should be avoided or something? Um, so test-driven development is <clears throat> is another controversial practice. Yeah. For some reason. I don't really understand why it is so controversial. Yeah. Uh, but it's one of those practices that it's it's really hard to discuss in a, 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 a out of context. Yeah. <clears throat> If you ask me um, why not so many companies do TDD, probably the, the best answer to that is because not many companies work in an agile way. And I know that that is a bit weird, right? It seems like a big logical leap. Right? You ask me about TDD and I'm replaying terms of agile. But the reason for that is that if, if someone asks me, why do I need to apply TDD? Why do I need to invest time and energy in learning TDD? I would probably avoid discussing TDD at that point. I would put it aside. Let's let's put aside the mechanics yeah. of TDD. It's not really relevant. Let's focus on where you want to go, what you want to achieve. You want to be agile, right? You want you want your company to have it work in an agile way. Yes. Okay. So do you agree that you need to continuously deliver a valuable software? Yes. So do you agree that continuous delivery, the best way of continuous delivery is how just humble and they finally are describing it in their book? Yes. Mm. So you agree that Continuous delivery is an extension of continuous integration. So you agree that continuous integration, the best way, I would explain why the best way of performing continuous integration is through trunk-based development. And trunk-based development being a flow of continuous small batches of high quality, fully tested, production grade software, I would explain how the best way to achieve that is TDD. Yeah. Because TDD offers all the benefits. It gives your code all the those attributes, right? Um, and so, as you can see, it's why I need to do TDD is is strictly related to the context. Is the, 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 to understand the reasons for TDD. You have to understand the reasons for the context. So we start from agile and we end up to TDD, right? And in, in the continuous delivery book, um, uh, Dave Farley and Jess Humble clearly say we think TDD is the only way you you can do all yeah. this. Um, and you asked another question. You said, "When is TDD not a good idea?" Um, I, I I I struggle uh, finding a context specific context where TDD is not a good idea. Also, because I think it's very close to how we traditionally write code. If you look at how we write code normally, say we write in a function. Yeah. Uh, we think of the name of a function, we think of the input of the function, we think of the return type of that function. So when we think of a function, we already think in terms of the outcome, what we want to get from that yeah. function, right? What what are we going to write in the return statement, right? And hopefully that function is going to be small, so that our, our thought is not very yeah. far from, from what to put in the return statement. So we are already thinking in terms of what to generate, right? What to get. 
And Jasmine Ramon is just one step ahead. It's just saying, okay, let's formalize that, that outcome, right? Let's make sure that the code you implement is the, doesn't have any scope creep. It doesn't go off a tangent. It's implementing just that, that expectation. Yeah. And so I don't really understand why people find it so anti-intuitive and so weird. When it, of, course, of course, it's inverting the two faces, right? But I, I think if you can write um, a, a code after, uh, tests after your code, you can write that before. There's really no, no reason why you should be doing that. I think the, the problems that sometimes people... Sorry, I, I moved my tip. The, the problem that people sometimes have with TDD are the problems you normally have with unit testing. Because mm. TDD is... It's closely associated with unit testing. I don't think it's entirely correct because TDD is focused on behaviors rather than just uh, units of, of structure. It's units of behaviors, yeah. not units of structure. But that's a problem with unit testing in general, right? The fact that if you are, if you write uh, if you adopt TDD not for uh, creating behaviors driven by tasks, but uh, let me see how to test this class. Let's create the behavior for this class. Uh, that's an, that's kind of an anti-pattern, right? And it's an anti-pattern with unit testing in general. When you write unit tests, you're not testing the behavior of a class or a mm -hmm. method. You're testing high behavior, yeah. which could be implemented by multiple classes, multiple methods. And also, there are some some I think that some technical mistakes uh, when when it, when when adopting TDD. Like for example, the red phase doesn't always fail, or the green phase is not the quickest way of making the test pass, people start writing a lot of code yeah. there. Or the refactor phase is not just refactoring that bit of code, but it's refactoring the whole thing and introducing some other code. So you have to be disciplined, yeah. right? You have to learn how to do it. And TDD is something that requires some time, some experience. Absolutely. So that's why often it's not it's not that well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think in, in my experience, whenever I've tried TDD, uh, the one thing I've really, you know, seen that it has added a lot of value to the way I've coded or delivered feature is I, I start to think incrementally, right? Because I'm focusing on one thing yes. at a time and uh, I, I, I write code, I make sure it works. And then I, I then I focus on refactoring. So uh, it, it tend, uh, we tend to happen, you know, it tends to happen that we start thinking of a feature as a whole. And there's a lot of things that we start thinking. Instead, if we break it down and uh, think in you know a more incremental fashion, you become more agile in, in your software development. So I think absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So that that has helped me a lot. Uh, one challenging thing I've always faced with TDD is when I'm working in a code base that I I don't know how it works. It's really like a legacy code base with no test cases, let's say, and I just have to add like a very small feature just a toggle for example right so in that case yeah. i find i can still do tdd uh, but i find it's it's a little bit overhead for me uh, because one yeah. i don't have enough context uh, two it's it's a simple change it might have yeah. more uh, overhead to add a test and you know follow a tdd as compared to just right doing it uh, and fixing the thing uh, but apart from that tdd has has helped me and I, I try to follow. I, I don't follow like very religiously, to be honest. I'm still improving on that. But I I find it better and better like each day passing. So well, I, I think the example that you um, just mentioned is is a typical example where TDD is probably not the best thing yeah. to do. Because um, it might, might be very difficult to do and it probably doesn't, doesn't lead to yeah. the benefits that normally does. And... Uh, you said something. I, I, I wasn't doing it in an ideal way. I'm not following religiously. I think. I think that there's really no ideal way. I mean, it's it's really, yeah. What you know, it's, it's as long as you stick to the basic principles, that that's fine. And and following religiously, I don't think we should be following practice religiously. I think it's always about what what works, um, and and always be because uh, because when people formalize test driven development they didn't know yeah. what you were doing <laughs> right <laughs> so, so of course there must be there must be differences Absolutely. i think that's so, a yeah. great point and that i think that applies to everything out there right <laughs> as we talked about Absolutely. great uh let's talk about the last thing and 
probably the most yeah. controversial thing or most talked about thing <laughs> so i did i did a podcast with curtis einsman on you know uh, yeah. code reviews and creating pull requests and how to do it effectively how to write comments on someone else's pull request and all that uh i i've mostly followed that and i've rarely done pair programming or any other you know mob programming for example in my organizations yeah. mainly because the way they were structured the way they were following processes yes uh so i wanted to ask you what are your thoughts on uh, mm-hmm. you know code reviews uh pair programming and mock programming and what has worked for you yeah i see many many times people tend to compare the two things like um code reviews versus pair programming and i think that's that's not really how it should yeah. be the comparison should be um asynchronous code reviews mm. versus continuous code reviews yeah. or if you look at it from a higher perspective it should really be non social programming versus social mm. programming uh, and by non social i don't mean anything negative it's not anti social <laughs> or a social yeah. i mean i mean it's just a way of saying this is probably people work, working alone versus people working yeah. together right um so my my view is that um the traditional way of doing code reviews so using pull requests is suboptimal based on uh, uh, um compared to continuous mm-hmm. reviews done with social programming yeah. practices everybody values continuous code reviews continuous code uh, sorry uh, values code reviews code reviews are absolutely required in software yeah. development you need to share knowledge you need to compare your views with someone else's you need to uh, have feedback about your yeah. code, right because it's an extremely difficult job and and working alone can be a strain can 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 get people off tangent and, and it's difficult to to develop good quality of all um I, I i think the <clears throat> the big problem i see with asynchronous code reviews is that they happen too late so they normally happen at the end of a development phase they happen too late they need you to wait for someone to give their feedback uh feedback sometimes tr- trickle through not and at a very slow pace so there's a lot of wait time uh which of course is going to increase the lead time of your of your changes um and i think late code reviews late prs are a manifestation of what is called sunk cost fallacy so you have invested time and energy in some work and people will be reluctant to destroy what you've done yeah. right they're not going to stump on your stump on your sand castle <laughs> after you you invested so much yeah. energy into it and you can see that sometimes in comments on prs where people are trying to be very cautious and say this is me nitpicking sorry for telling you this sorry for being a pest maybe not in this pr let's do it in the next pr so they are already thinking in terms of technical mm-hmm. debt because they don't want to instigate a big rework of those changes especially if you are close to the end of the iteration or to close to delivery so i think it's sometimes as a way of producing suboptimal code designed which is worse than you could create and and it kind of um affects your th- general throughput um there's a person called um Dragan Stepanovich who's a great guy posting very valuable stuff on linkedin i strongly suggest following him he did a very an excellent analysis of how asynchronous code reviews can chill a company's throughput with, with data analyzing a large number of prs and and analyzing the level of engagements wait times and yeah. so on and and that's really great because it gives data right it's not just me saying in my opinion right it's it's looking at data from i think 500 mm-hmm. prs in that in that context um and obviously the way my preferred way of doing reviews is is continuously like by working together with other people adopting pair programming or social or or, or mob programming um or ensemble programming so people don't like the word mob um and so basically have the whole team work together um on 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 the same code and and capturing uh, problems as early as possible uh defining design together rather than validated post post um, development 
and um, and there's there's a number of benefits also in terms of sharing knowledge, uh, getting people up to speed, um, and uh, and yeah, so in general, it's it's a great way of of keeping the team's morale high. Um, oh, the light, my light, went off. Um, because um, because it's 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 a way of making everybody feel uh, on the same page and involved in in yeah. work, um, which, which is great for a team. I have a uh, I have a strict definition of teamwork. Um, uh, for me, teamwork is when people work together. And together, for me, has a strict implication in terms of time and space. So we are doing this together because we are yeah. here together, yeah. right? We are we are at doing this at the same time, but also in the same not not co-located, but physically yeah. in the same in the same uh, 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 virtual yeah. space. Um, and and that's for me how a team should be working. Um, of course, there are downsides. I mean, more programming can be um, uh, exhausting, yeah. can be uh, tiring for some people. They need some me yeah. time, right? But I, and, and that's fine. You you can do that. You can do breaks. You can take you know pause. You can you can uh, work the afternoon. You can work on your own. Yeah. That's fine. But I think I think that there should be a level of preference in the team. I mean, we. If we can't, let's do more programming. And if we don't, can't do more programming, that let's do paid programming. If we can't do paid programming, let's go, let go solo. But I think working solo should really be the last option. Uh, of course, people say you can mix the two things, right? You can do pair programming and still ask someone else to, to review yeah. your code. That's probably one of the most common ways of doing it because you might have a subject matter expert yeah. in your team that, that you can involve, right? But yeah, okay, you can do that. Uh, but there's still a problem yeah. there. That if the this person tells you you've done something significantly wrong, uh, then you're gonna have to rework what you've done, and that what you've done, and that so you basically wasted mm -hmm. time working on that stuff. Um, so yeah, I, I, I mean, teams should adopt whatever works in their in their context. Absolutely. There are contexts where they cannot adopt more programming, either because people don't want to do it. Some people are, are you know. Especially if you work with neurodivergent mm. people, have a problem, you know, uh, working yeah. with others or so spending so not working with others, but spending, you know, time to get yeah. physically together with other people, um, um, and uh, or sometimes managers who, who think in, in quantitative yeah. terms rather than qualitative terms, like they say, why two people should be doing the work of one, right? And then the answer to that that requires a long discussion, more difficult discussion, where you try to. Uh, explain why it's quality that you want, not quantity, right? My, my idea of a team is a group of people who uh, work together because we want to produce better yeah. results, not because they want to produce more results. So it's not a matter of quantity, it's a matter of quality. Yeah. Um, so yeah, this is this is this is my view. Oh, I hope I've not pissed anyone <laughs> by saying <laughs> this, um, uh, but uh, it's. Um, yeah, it's it's really what works best for you. There are some contexts where you don't have that level of psychological mm. safety uh, where you can use um, um, social programming approaches, and I understand that. I think I think it's always a matter of continuous Absolutely. improvement. So if you if you if you can explore social programming approaches, definitely do, because I I I've encouraged companies to embrace them, and they got a lot of benefits. And people who were reluctant at first, they ended up lo loving it. So if my my the takeaway should be if you can explore more programming, please, please absolutely. Do it. I think that was a very clear and you know detailed answer. So thanks a lot for for you know sh uh, sh sharing so. <laughs> sharing your experiences. And I think I I totally agree with that. You know, I, although I don't have a lot of experience in doing pair programming, mm. I also find it a little challenging because I was trying it for the first time, and it takes time and it takes some practice to you know get better at it and it also depends on who you are pair programming with or you know socializing Absolutely. with and uh, great so i think it boils down to you know there are so many software engineering practices but nothing is a silver bullet and there's always context attached to it so try it out and you know whatever works for you try to make it make some uh, modifications and make it work for you basically and be more agile as as much as possible and solve for the customer i think that's the gist of what we have discussed uh, today yeah. right? so uh thanks a lot andrea for you know joining this episode i'm really uh, i'm really excited that 
we did this and uh, i'm i'm looking forward to you know more collaboration uh, with you on on such interesting topics so i hope you also enjoyed uh, the discussion and i i look forward to releasing it and see uh, what our viewers think about uh, our discussion so thanks a lot yes it was it, it was a great pleasure kb thank you very much